This is the 15th in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll think about plane algebraic curves. Think about a, a, a curve in the plane given by an algebraic equation y squared is x squared plus x cubed. If you draw the picture, which points in the plane satisfy it, that looks something like this. So um, there's a, one obvious solution um, to that equation, which is that you could look at xy equals 0, 0. Of course, we're doing this over the real numbers to get the picture. So we can imagine that our field is the field of real numbers. Um, now, one trick that works nicely with this equation is that we could just look at um, the lines, the origin, that, um, the origins on there. And so if you looked at a line through the origin, it might hit another point that's also on there. We could try and find that point. Um, so let's think about how that looks. Um, if you were to plug in that you're on a line through the origin, that line would be given by, um, say, y equals tx, some linear equation has to go through the origin, so the constant part coefficient is 0, and there's some slope t. We plug that into this equation here for our curve. Um, our equation y squared is x squared plus x cubed. So y is tx, we get tx squared plus x squared plus x cubed. Uh, sorry, is equal to x squared plus x cubed. And we can divide it a factor of x squared. We get t squared equals 1 plus x. And so that gives us x is t squared minus 1. And since y is tx, we get y equals t times that, t squared minus 1. That enables us to draw the, to parameterize the curve, which is something we, we figured out how to do previously. But it also tells us how to solve for the points that lie on the curve. Now that's not a trick that's going to work in general, but it is an observation that sometimes we can we can understand a lot about an algebraic curve by by simple uh, geometric techniques, by drawing pictures and thinking about what the pictures are telling us. Sometimes we can get somewhere with the algebra, and you could think purely about this polynomial as as being some kind of al algebraic equation. And if you, you work purely with with algebraic symbols, going back to our original equation for it, you might not get very far. But if you start thinking about how to draw with pictures, you might get a lot more information about the algebra based on just looking at the pictures. So a plane algebraic curve, also called an algebraic curve in the plane, um, is the set of zeros of zeros of uh, a non-constant polynomial in uh, some x, y, and two variables, x and y, with presumably coefficients in whatever we want to work on. Um, we might be interested, so far we're interested in real number coefficients, but we might be interested in other ones. For example, we remember the famous Fermat's last theorem, which of course is not a theorem of Fermat, um, strangely enough. Um, Fermat's last theorem says that if you, uh, if you try and, and find integer solutions to a n plus b n equals c n, uh, a, b, and c integers, um, and n is greater than or equal to 3 is also an integer, then um, then you can't do it with, with all of the solutions being, uh, being let's say, positive numbers, for example. Positive. Um, there are no solutions. Now, um, from the perspective of this theory of algebraic curves, plane algebraic curves, you could say this is this isn't really about a curve. It's got three variables in it. But if we divide the C off to off we we get um divide both sides by C, we can write it as x to the n plus y to the n equals one, where x and y are no longer integers but rational numbers. And so this really is about this plane algebraic curve because if you had integer solutions here you could divide by C and get a, a point on this curve. A over C would be X, B over C would be Y. On the other hand, if you have a, a rational point in this curve, you can clear denominators and you get back to this equation here. So the the, the, the problem of, of finding uh, these uh, solutions to Fermat's last theorem is the same problem as finding rational points on this algebraic curve. And that's a motivation for why we would care about algebraic curves, about plane algebraic curves. Um, over the, the, the rational numbers, not just over the real numbers. 
a trick for studying um, algebraic curves, let's say over, as you know, some of our examples are algebraic curves over um, uh, over the integers. So if we're interested in integer point uh, solutions of integer coefficient polynomials, so polynomials with integer coefficients in two variables, then an obvious trick is to take the, the, the polynomial and reduce all the coefficients and look for solutions in, um, you could look for solutions uh, mod uh, prime p, p is prime uh, is a prime integer. So you can mod out all the all the coefficients, but you also mod out x and y, and you look for to see if you can find x and y in the in the integers mod p that solve the equation mod p. Um, and so that suggests that we also care about not only do we care about uh, rational solutions and integer solutions, we also care about um, finite field solutions. Another example, if we start thinking about problems in which we have parameters varying, um, we might look at a, a circle uh, of some radius, uh, and uh, we could ask for what are the solutions of this thing. Now, if the, if the number c is positive, it's a circle, but if we looked at something like x squared plus y squared is minus 7, it doesn't seem to have any, any, uh, solution, uh, any solutions because it's now a circle of... Um, of radius, it's not radius minus seven, it's actually radius square root minus seven. Um, so it doesn't seem to have any, any real points. So it's sort of a curve in the plane, but without any real points in the curve. But of course we know that there will in fact be complex points. And so we're interested not only as we, if we allow ourselves to uh, consider curves that vary with parameters, which is a natural thing to want to do, and understand how the solutions behave, we have uh, when we have positive values of this parameter, we get the real solutions have uh, become a circle. But when we have negative values, they, they disappear, but they're still complex points. And so it's worth thinking about the behavior of those complex points as well as we vary these parameters. So we're naturally interested also in, in, in complex points, not just real points. And so that leads us to the following um, simple definition that um, a, a point of... Uh, a plane algebraic curve um, over uh, over a field uh, K means for us um, a point uh, x naught y naught satisfying the equation of the curve. So the curve has some uh, non-constant polynomial equation, but um, allowing the x naught and the y naught to be in k bar some algebraic closure. We'll always, we'll always imagine that we've fixed an algebraic closure for our field, uh, whatever our field, um, whatever our field k is that we're working in, we'll always allow ourselves to fix some algebraic closure for k bar. And uh, we know that those are really unique up to isomorphism anyway, so we're not uh, making any causing ourselves any problems by picking one such. And then we'll say that we're really not interested just in the points that are live over k, but the points that all live all the way over k bar. In other words, over all the all the subfields really, uh, all the all the algebraic extensions of k. And this ha this immediately solves problems about not having any solutions because if you have a, a polynomial equation p of x y equals zero and you want to solve it you want to solve it, if you pick um x naught so that p of x naught y is not constant, then you know that there are solutions. Um, there are solutions. Uh, solutions y naught. And similarly, if you pick, if you picked a y naught um, instead of picking an x naught, you could pick a y naught. Instead of this guy being constant, it could be p of um, of x y naught that we solve. And so uh, if they're not going to be any solutions, well, it'd have to be constant when you plug in any value for x and constantly plug in any value for y. And that, without too much difficulty, makes it clear that it becomes constant. So there really aren't any problems here. If you have, um, if you work in the algebraic closure, you always have lots of solutions. There are lots of solutions you want to in the algebraic closure, but you have to work in the algebraic closure to get them. So there's always lots and lots of solutions. There's really infinitely many solutions of these, of the uh, of infinitely many points on the algebraic curve. Um, but the points aren't necessarily living in the field we started with.
we need to think about some other simple examples and ways in which things could be a bit strange. One of them, which has already become clear to us, is that you could have something like an equation, uh, equation say, of a parabola, but if you bring it to a very large power, to the ninth power, the, the numbers x and y for which the ninth power is zero are the same as the numbers for which the first power is zero. So this equation has the same solutions, even over the algebraic closure, as this equation, because if the ninth power is number zero, then it's zero. Um, so we can always reduce down to the point where we don't have it being a power of anything. Um, and uh, so the equation isn't really unique, but it's unique uh, once more or less up to constants. Once we get rid of this problem about powers, then we've reduced it down as far as it can go. But there's still another problem, which is that if you look at a very simple example, zero equals x, y, that's satisfied when x is zero. It's also satisfied when y is zero. So the x, y plane, the solutions are the x-axis and the y-axis. Those are the two solutions. And we can split that up. That uh, those pr product is 0 exactly when 0 is x or uh, 0 is y. In other words, it splits into two. So the algebraic curve is the union of two curves. It's the union of this curve and this curve. And that's a more general phenomenon that we can always split um, uh, the equation into, into irreducible polynomials. And we know that that's unique, that that splitting is essentially unique up to constants. So, um, so therefore, we can say that um, they call it, which are called the, um, the well, that splits, we can say it splits the curve into a union of curves, like this example of curves, um, which are said to be irreducible curves. They're called the components. And so it's an irreducible curve, um, uh, an irreducible plane algebraic curve when it has uh, just one component. In other words, when it it's uh, it's a, given by an irreducible uh, polynomial after we uh, factor it out uh, from itself. When when we get rid of the problem of, of having multiple powers, we get to the point of having only one irreducible factor, um, and then it's just a power of that factor up to a constant, then it becomes a, the zeros of an irreducible polynomial. We call that an irreducible curve. It then follows for an irreducible curve that, of course, it uh, determines its uh, it determines its equation um, up to the equation of the curve determined up to a, a non-zero constant multiple because it splits into irreducibles, but there's only one irreducible. The irreducible then is uniquely determined up to a non-zero constant. And to prove all this that we've said here, you really just use um, what we've already understood before about about Bezu coefficients and about the um, the way in which we we get common factors. What we know is that if you had infinitely many um, common roots of two equations, then they'd have to have a common uh, common factor. We said that there were infinitely many uh, common uh, solutions, zeros, um, of two uh, these polynomial equations in two variables, x and y. Um, that would imply that there was a common factor because the result would have infinitely many zeros, so there'd have to be a common factor. Uh, in fact, a common factor over the field k we started with, because it has to have a common factor over k bar, but in fact, it actually has to have one over k, because the resultant actually vanishes not just over k bar, but also over k. And so you, you can split it up into these, into these, uh, well, this common factor, so that means there's a, there's a component living in both curves. And so if it's an irreducible curve, they have to be the same. So curves, um, are nice to look at, but wh what do they have to do with algebra? Um, we want to construct out of them algebras um, and fields. A regular function, a regular function on a plane algebraic curve. Um, so, uh, is the um, is the restriction of a polynomial of a polynomial, some p of x, y on, on the x, y plane, so in k of x, y. So this is a plane algebraic curve over a field k. And we're always working over fields. We won't worry about uh, 
algebraic curves over other rings, just fields. Um, so it's a restriction of this guy in here to the points. Remember, points live in the algebraic closure, the points of, uh, of the curve. So two polynomials that, that restrict to give the same, the, same, uh, the same function on the points of the curve will be the same for us. And that sounds a little bit dangerous, but of course it, it's not going to be a problem because we're, the points are over the algebraic closure, so there's lots and lots of points as we've seen. So as an example on our ex uh, simple example of y squared is x squared plus x cubed, again it looks something like this, um, we have that of course then y squared and um, x squared plus x cubed are the same function. They're the same uh, regular function. So among the regular functions we have sometimes uh, non-obvious identities, sometimes obvious identities, and we'll write um, we'll write them as k of c. That's the regular the set of regular functions. Okay, they really can be thought of as functions uh, on the curve on curve c. Um, they can be really thought of as functions because they're, they're, we take their values at points, but the points are living with the algebraic closure. And of course, this is also a k-algebra because we only allow the coefficients of our polynomials to be from the given k, not from the closure, not from the algebraic closure k-bar. And um, what we want to do, of course, is to relate the curves to one another, a regular morphism. Uh, C to D of algebraic curves, plain algebraic curves, um, plain algebraic curves is a map, is a map of the form uh, f of x and y is some uh, s of x and y and some t of x and y, where these guys uh, have to be in the, in the, um, in the, the regular functions of C, and um, so these are regular functions, and uh, with f of x and y in D for all x and y that we can plug in in the closure of the field. So, um, so that's what we'll mean by a by a regular morphism. And we're really interested in those objects as, as a way to deal with the regular functions. So what we've now done is to create, for every algebraic curve, uh, an algebra. And, um, and that means that we, we constructed a huge collection of different algebras over, a given, over each field k. We've got an enormous collection of interesting algebras, which could be quite different, and which we hope to understand by drawing pictures of the curves, relating the geometry, the geometric picture of the curve, to the algebraic structure of this algebra. Um, now we can use more regular morphisms to try and relate different curves to one another. So as an example of a, of a regular morphism, let's let f of x and y be some polynomial s, polynomial t in x and y, which will be simply 1 minus x squared x. Um, and then that, that'll take a curve, which is simply the curve y equals 0, to the curve d, which is the curve... Um, t uh, squared equals s squared plus s cubed, if I've got it right. Um, this should be, sorry, this should be probably x times, uh, what do I want to do here? I've got it as x. I think it should be, sorry, this, I think this should be, what was it before? It was x squared minus 1 and x times x squared minus 1. And that relates these two, uh, these two curves. So, um, then a regular morphism with a regular morphism inverse is a biregular morphism. For example, um, if we look at the maps, um, we look at, at um, f of x, y equals um, s, t is, um, is uh, let's say, x, x squared. And then if we look at g of s, t is x, y is, um, let's say, uh, s, s, then um, 
if we let the curve C be just um, x equals y and the curve D be t equals s squared, we can see right away that uh, x and y being equal doesn't really do much about this map, but it, uh, this map will take whatever the x value is, make that be the s, and its square will be the t. So it will certainly map uh, the, the um, map this line or, or any line that's parameterized by the x variable to this curve, right? So it'll map this guy here. And then, um, then when we go backwards, we've got t equals s squared. We just take s, s, but that reverses this map because it, can makes, uh, it makes s give us back x. And then we forget what t is. We just forget about that and go back to x, x. And so we go back to this, to this line. So we can see that this map, uh, the, these maps are inverses along the curves, right? But they're not uh, along, only along the curves, c and d. But they're not inverses in the whole plane, only along the curves. Let's look at some simple examples of this process in action. We won't do the full theory of all the plane conics. A conic is a, a degree two uh, curve. A degree one curve, of course, a line, and then uh, and so on. We have cubics and quartics and so on and so forth. So let's look a little bit at conics. And let's suppose, just for simplicity, that K is a field uh, not of characteristic two. Remember that characteristic not characteristic two means two is not zero. Characteristic two is when two is zero um, in, in our field. In other words, one plus one gives zero. Um, so if we're, we're going to field not of characteristic 2, so 2 is not 0, we can divide by 2. Um, that's the main idea. And um, what we'll find is that, well, that every conic um, in the plane um, is, is by regular 2. And we don't want to give the full list because it gets quite complicated, but let's just do the first part of it, 2 at most 1 of the following sort of equations of curves, and we'll describe some of the geometry of that curve, what does it look like in some sense, and then talk about its regular function algebra as an abstract algebra. Um, so what, what are some, some, of the, some of the different possibilities here? Well, the obvious, first obvious thing is we could look at a line, and then once you set y to zero, you've only got x left over, and so the regular functions are just the functions of x. Um, you could look at x, y is 0, and that's just a pair of lines. This, of course, is when I say it's a, it's a conic, of course, it, we could say it's y squared equals 0 if you want to make it have degree 2. Um, this is a pair of, of lines um, meeting at a point in the plane, and um, so they're not parallel lines. And then uh, on one of them, you're going to have an x variable because it's going to be x is uh, y is zero. Uh, when you have y is zero, you have the x variable. And when x is zero, you have the y variable. It's not irreducible. You can see that this thing actually um, splits into this sum uh, of the of the regular functions on each. And um, then the other w one we could get, we could try x y is is one quadratic equation, and that's of course famously a hyperbola. At least it, when I say geometry, I'm thinking of the real uh, case where our, where um, where our uh, field is the real numbers, what does it look like? It's a hyperbola geometrically. And the field of functions is, well, you can take any x and any y polynomials, but you've got to always make y be a reciprocal to x. And so it's, it's actually the field we described before is the field given by an x and an x inverse, because it's all the x's and y's, but every time a y hits into an x, you can use this rule to simplify when you're on the curve. And so uh, when you're on this curve with this equation, y is always 1 over x, and so it becomes polynomials in an x and an x inverse. Um, another example would be um, something like y equals x squared or parabola, which we've already looked at. So it's a parabola geometrically when we draw it over the real numbers, so you get a parabola. And then the functions are just k of x because any time you have a y, you can just replace it by an x squared, so it becomes a function of x. So all the functions of x and y become just functions of x. Another possibility is you could have an equation like um, you could have a pair of lines, y minus 1, y plus 1 equals 0, so y is plus or minus 1. Um, and so you get a pair of parallel lines. Um, as a possibility. And then you get two copies again of um, of the uh, the regular functions are regular functions on one line plus the regular functions on another line, which I'll give another need another variable for. I guess I can call it 
call it y or something uh, it doesn't really matter but you need a variable to go up one line and a variable to go up the other line um, and it shouldn't really be the y variable in some sense because it's we're setting the y's to a constant but we have two different lines to work on so so the regular functions are consist of all the choices of one of them on one and one of them on the other another more sophisticated example would be something like y is plus or minus alpha we'll see that this occurs where we have a pair of uh, parallel lines but um, the uh, they're over some alpha where alpha is uh, squared is in our field but alpha is not in our field and so we, we there their lines over this k of alpha over some field extension and then it turns out that it's one copy of k of alpha of x is the regular functions and there are some other possibilities which I won't go into I just want to give these as some examples of different regular function algebras that show up in, in, in different simple examples so let's see something of the proof at least uh, some outline of the proof of how you'd how you'd see this happening it's really just very straightforward in that we write down an equation zero equals f of x and y and some polynomial is supposed to be degree two so it's ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus now we need some linear term say rx plus sy plus t for example uh, where abc RS, RST are going to be constants from our field and um, of course if uh, if we have 0 equals A equals B equals C if they're all 0 then it's linear and then we're done um, and so we want to move on to to some non-zero cases what if uh, we had 0 being equal to let's say these two A and C uh, what happens in that case then it would simplify we could scale uh, well, let's let's we can assume since we've already done a, b, and c, all zero is done. We assume that one of them is non-zero. If a and c are zero, let's suppose b is non-zero, and then we can scale to both sides of the equation to get b equals one, and then our equation becomes um, becomes simply x y um, plus uh, r x plus s y plus t, um, and then what we can do is to try and split it. Um, into um, 0 equals x plus s uh, y plus r plus t minus r s so we can we're factoring out so make that a bit simpler and then um, then we can we can by regularly change the x variable to x plus s and the y variable to y plus r we can carry out by regular changes because we're allowed to take any uh, polynomial replacements we can invert with polynomials and so we can make this therefore b0 equals xy plus and we can absorb that into a constant we just call t um, and if t is 0 then that gives us um, that we have x equals 0 or y equals 0 as our as a pair of, of lines um, and in that case we can see the function algebra because um, if you take any polynomial in x and y and you put it restricted to this guy uh, it's it's given by the equation x y equals zero so any time the an x multiplies by y you have to get zero so you take any polynomial with any amount of terms in all these x's and y's all powers of x something uh, to some power y to some power all those terms but every time there's an x and a y in it they both uh, they disappear together and so it, it reduces down to terms that only have a pure x or a pure y they don't have both in them and so your polynomial reduces down to polynomial in x and polynomial in y. And so, we've, as we said, a polynomial on each of the axes, uh, one polynomial each. And so you get a sum of these two, uh, these two rings. We, obviously, with the with the identification that the constants are treated as being the same constants on the two, for the two of them. So, so to be more precise, it really is actually, I guess, k of x plus k of y, modulo uh, the constants. Um, so we have to modulate them out to make them be the same constants. So, um, okay, so that's not quite what I said, but anyway, more or less, um, it's more or less the sum of those two rings. Now we could also consider the case that what if t is not zero, and then you can rescale uh, both sides of the equation to get, you can rescale, say, the x or the y, if you like, to get t equal to minus one, and then you've got x, y equals one, and then, as we said before, that gives you k of x, x inverse um, as the, the regular um, functions. 
And now we can go back and say, okay, we assumed that A and C were both zero up here, and we worked out various cases, and now we want to look at what happens if if they're not, um, if that doesn't happen, if they're not zero, if A is not zero, for example, um, then we can scale, again, both sides of the equation to get A equals one, and then um, we're gonna just complete the square. So it's gonna be zero equals X squared plus BX Y plus C Y squared plus Rx plus Sy plus T, and we're gonna rewrite that as X plus B Y over two squared um, plus C minus B squared over four, I think. Um, leave you to check the details. Y squared plus uh, Rx plus Sy plus T, something like that. And then um, hopefully I'll get all that worked out correctly. Um, so you can simplify that by, again by changing variables and simplify it to be um, of the form, if we, we decide we want to change the variables, we can make it be x squared plus a constant y squared plus rx plus s y plus t. Note that I used a 2 here. I divided it to a 2 and a 4. So they have to be non-zero to make that work. So we can't work this out in a field of characteristic 2. It's much more complicated there. Um, so then, um, then we can um, complete the square x plus r over 2 squared plus da 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 and simplify that. And so we can get, reduce the thing down to having the form 0 equals x squared plus a constant y squared plus s y plus t. We keep going now. We can look at the case of if c is 0, then um, we've got an equation 0 is x squared plus s y plus t. And if s is uh, uh, 0, we get... Um, 0 equals x squared plus t, so x is um, plus or minus the square root of minus t, and so we get two parallel lines, but either over our field or over an extension of the field. And I'll leave you to check the regular functions on that if you extend the field. And then, um, and then if s is not 0, um, then you've got uh, 0 equals x squared uh, minus well, why? Because you can, it's a non-zero linear function, you can change variables to make this guy just become minus y instead of being sy plus t by changing the linear change of variables of the y variable, and so you get a parabola. Um, and so, uh, uh, so you've got a, um, a bunch of, uh, you know, of equations that more or less are the ones that I said um, in the list above. But then we have to do what if c is not zero, um, and I'll, I'll lead you to let you consider um, from there on more or less what happens. It's pretty straightforward. So we've given rise to interesting algebras um, by saying that we looked at all the polynomial functions, but we're strictly just to the curve itself, and so they, we get that the equation of the curve, for example, is vanishing. But we also want to give rise to fields and what we'll call those fields of rational functions on the curve. So a rational function on an algebraic curve, on a plane algebraic curve, on a plane algebraic curve, um, let's say C, given by an equation C of x, y equals zero uh, over a over a field k um, is a is a rational um, is a rational function just any rational function of x and y, um, but uh, uh, but defined only up to adding. Multiples of the defining uh, equation c of x y, which we assume is irreducible, right? Um, should be on a reduce an irreducible, sorry, irreducible plane is right. We won't worry about reducible ones. Um, so you can add multiples of the defining equation um, to numerator and denominator and denominator. Uh, and we'll assume, of course, the denominator isn't divisible by um, by that. So denominator 
uh, not uh, divisible by that by that equation. So it, with what we're looking at then, maybe to make it a little bit clearer, is that we have a uh, rational function would be given by some polynomial over some other polynomial. But I'd consider that to be the same rational functions as function as if I were to add any multiple p of x, y of the defining equation to the numerator, capital P of x, y, and then also add anything I wanted to the denominator. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to check that in fact these can be defined as uh, as actual functions. So we were worried before about rational functions. And we said, well, we don't think of them as functions, but as formal expressions. We define these as formal expressions. But we don't have to worry about that anymore, because these can be defined as rational functions on the points over the algebraic closure, k bar points, the points those, whose coordinates lie on k bar of the curve. So we've allowed points of the curve to live in any extension, in particular to lie in this, this particular to chose, this chosen algebraic closure. And that's a actually going to mean that there was, we said before that there are lots of them. There are infinitely many of these points. Um, and, uh, and, and that if, if something vanishes at all of them, then it has to be a multiple of c of x. So I'll leave you to check that that makes sure that this can, these can actually be thought of now as functions. They, they're, they, once you know their values as functions on the points of the curve, uh, you know what they are. And uh, so there's nothing to worry about there. It's a simple example of such a of such a, a construction, we go back to our friend the parabola, and um, and we can look at a function, and we worry about this function. Um, it might be that it lo it looks like x minus y. It looks like trouble uh, trouble at uh, the origin uh, because the origin this is going to vanish. That looks bad. But the, the numerator vanishes there too, so there's a chance this might work out. Let's see. Um, one way to deal with it is to plug in that y equals x squared on the parabola. So as a function on the, we're looking at again on the parabola. We're looking at this function at f. We can just call it f of x y, but it's it's thought of as a function on the points of the on the points of the algebraic on the algebraic closure for the parabola. So, um, but that means on the parabola y equals x squared, and so we can put an x squared in there. And now it doesn't look so dangerous because, in fact, there's a factor of x in the numerator and a factor of x in the denominator. And so we can cancel the factors of x. And now it's clearly defined at the origin. So that's an important example because it looks sometimes like there's trouble, but sometimes it really isn't trouble. It's not there because this isn't that simple. It's not just a rational function. It's a rational function on the parabola. So we'll say that a, a function is regular, uh, a rational function is regular at a point um, if uh, we can somehow write it. Uh, so a rational function is a regular point. We somehow write it uh, with a non-zero uh, denominator. Uh, at that point. Well, the denominator is the denominator's not zero at that point. An interesting example of a, of an of a algebraic curve following our very strange definition that the points get to lie over the uh, over the, the closure is to look at this guy. Um, we'll look at the circle of radius zero, and if you looked at it in traditional geometry terms, it'd just be the origin, it'd be a single point, and we're working over the over the real numbers. So our field K is R. Um, so you might think of that as just a point, but it's not just a point because we have to work with its with its point with its points living in the algebraic closure. Its points just don't don't let us live in R; they live in R bar, which is C. So it has some field of fractions. Uh, it has some field or some field of rational of rational functions, um, which is this thing here. Um, and uh, but uh, it has such a thing, but that's because it's again it's an irreducible, which is something you have to think about. It's 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 not it doesn't split over the real numbers um, into a product of linears because that was otherwise would be a pair of lines. Um, so it, it it's irreducible, 
and so it has this this field. We said that these were defined for for irreducible curves. We didn't know what to what to do with them if they if they was reducible. But the weird thing is that c is reducible over so over the complex numbers. Um, it's a reducible curve over the complex numbers, just not over the real numbers. So it has a field of, of it has a, a a field of rational functions over the real numbers, but it doesn't have a field of it doesn't have um, a field of rational functions over the complex numbers, which is sort of strange. Um, why is it reducible? Because uh, simply x squared plus y squared splits into x plus i y and x minus i y. So what does this do? How does what effect does this have on our on our picture of our um, of, of this this field, what do the elements look like in this guy here? Um, well, the typical element is going to look, well, every element is going to look like a ratio of polynomials. But I'm going to write them with only one linear y, because why do I do that? Because according to our equation of the curve, x squared, well, let's write it as x squared plus y squared is 0, which we can rewrite as exactly y squared is minus x squared. So it means that if you have any polynomial in x's and y's, every time you hit two y's together, you can place it by a minus x squared. So any term that's more than linear in y, every quadratic or higher term in y, I just replace with, with its expression in x's. And that way, I can always write it as linear in y. And then the denominator will be some denominator. Similarly, only linear in y at most. Um, so it's convenient to then think of it if, if y squared is minus a, a, x squared, that's uh, taking both squares of both sides. y is a kind of square root of minus x squared. And so we can really say that somehow this thing is, um, is equal to the, to, the, to the rational functions in x together with a, minus, a square root for minus x squared. And, and that wouldn't be something you'd find in the ordinary and the ordinary uh, rational functions. Um, so you can think of it that way. Another way to think of it is to say we're allowing, we go back to this expression here, we could think, write that if you like, as b of x plus, if you write y as, as a square root, um, if you like, you could write it as a kind of i times, well, as minus, uh, square root of minus x squared times c of x. Uh, and then this guy as d of x plus square root minus x squared times e of x. But we can actually find a field in which there is a, a square root of minus x squared. We could just write these things as uh, ix c of x and then divide by d of x plus ix e of x. What does that look like? The b's, the c's, and the d's, and the e's are all real. b of x dot 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 are real polynomials in x. So we've got these real polynomials in x, but then if you have an x factor in here, you're allowed to have some imaginary part. You can think about it, you get a real part which could have any any real parts to and any power of x, but this guy has to have the positive power of x and then it gets to have an imaginary part. And the same down here. So you can think of this field as actually being the field of complex coefficient polynomials, but where the real part if the numerator and the denominator has to be, or the, sorry, the, 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 the constant coefficient of part has to be real. So you can think of them as, um, so they're complex rational functions of x, but uh, with um, real, uh, with um, uh, real constant terms in the numerator and denominator. And that gives you a, so an interesting example of a field coming out of an irreducible curve. Um, again, since we have this notion of amorphism, we might as well have one for these guys, a rational amorphism, a rational morphism C to D, um, let's say F takes C to D of plane algebraic curves, um, uh, is a map uh, which can be expressed somehow as um, it's much like the story of the of, of the the regular maps s of x y and t of x y except these are now allowed to be rational uh, on c so rational functions but restricted to the points of c and um, so that uh, um, that so that uh, wherever at whatever points, uh, both 
s and x and t of x and y at every points of the curve where they're both uh, defined. In other words, where they're both regular. Uh, we said regular meant they were defined at or near that point, right? So they're defined at a point. They have denominators such are non-zero at that point. Regular. Um, where they're both regular, um, the, uh, the point f of x and y is then defined, and it has to be a point of d. So that's a regular, uh, that's a rational morphism. It has the possibility of being not defined everywhere. It's much, uh, much looser a notion than being a regular morphism. Because regular morphisms had these polynomials, and they're defined everywhere. Now we're allowed to be rational functions, the two components, uh, to be rational functions, and then they don't have to be defined everywhere. And um, this leads to a, to a straightforward lemma which relates the whole notion of, of, of construction of, algebra, of algebraic curves to the notions of, of, of fields. Um, if we have irreducible plane algebraic curves, C and D, then um, over a field K, uh, then they are birational. That is to say there's a rational map, the rational, a rational morphism is a rational inverse. Um, so I didn't write that down, what rational a uh, birational means, of course, rational with a map with a rational inverse. Uh, if and only if the fields of functions are uh, are abstractly uh, isomorphic as um, extensions of the underlying field K. And the, I won't give all the details of the proof. I'll give some idea of what you do for the proof. Um, if uh, you have a, have a birational map, then uh, rational morphism of curves, then it's fairly easy to relate the functions because the functions on one, the functions on another are related by just composing the with that with that birational morphism. So you have some map that takes C to D, and then you take a, a function here on D, let's call it um, G, and then you look at this function, and this is some uh, rational function, which you think of as taking values in, well, sorry, values in some k bar, or values in some k, um, some rational function, then you just take g composed f, and that gives you uh, your uh, your function. So um, so that, that relates the, the functions, and I won't worry about giving all the details of that. Um, so if you ra by rationally map the points to the points, then you, uh, in, in you, you compose rational functions with rational functions, you get rational functions, and so you get uh, the rational functions related to one another. Um, and on the other hand, if you had an abstract uh, abstract map, um, if the uh, k of c is birational to k of d, uh, sorry, is, um, is isomorphic to k of d as field extensions of, of k, then there's some isomorphism between them, from k of c to k of d between the function fields, uh, between these um, the fields of rational functions. And so, uh, so what you can do is simply um, um, you just um, take some variables, so we're going to have, say, x's and y's in this, pic this picture with a curve c, and let's call these a u and v, some curve d, and then we'll simply let, um, so we have a, a map that associates polynomials to polynomials, and we create a polynomial uh, in the x-y variables, which is simply phi inverse of, uh, of the, the polynomial u in the u and v variables, and similarly we can let t be the polynomial we get from V. And I'll let you to, to fill in. There's lots of details there, but that gives you an outline of what steps to take. And you can fill in the details to see that that actually does give uh, an isomorphism of the fields. Or sorry, from the isomorphism of the fields gives it gives it gives a birational morphism of the uh, of the curves. A particular curve is said to be rational. Um, a rational curve is one which is birational to a line. So another way to say that is you have some abstract curve C, and we want to know if it looks like a line, but um, what is what are the functions of the line? The line is given in the xy plane uh, by just uh, setting y equals 0. And so it's only really the x, as we said before. It's just the x variables left over, and so all the rational functions become the functions of x. So, uh, so if a rational curve is a, is a curve whose uh, uh, whose field of rational functions is isomorphic to the field of rational functions in one variable. And if we go back to our favorite example to look for a, a birational map, um, we can look at uh, the map which we saw before, which is some parameterization of a of a 
the curve, you can think of t belonging to some line, uh, some t axis, and maybe some plane whose other variable that I need to give a name to. But this map t goes to x, t, y of t, which we've written many times now. It's t squared minus 1, t times t squared minus 1. And it draws, um, it takes the t axis here and draws for us, parameterizes this this uh, algebraic curve here, which was given by y squared equals x squared plus x cubed. So this is the this was simply given by if we let these variables be s. Let's say this is this is the line s equals zero, and uh, that's one algebraic curve, um, which is, uh, is is of course just a line. And then let's call it I don't know l. And uh, and then this guy is another algebraic curve. Let's call it maybe c. Um, and so what we found is that this 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 is a map from l to c. Um, and uh, and it's perfectly well defined, um, but we could worry about how to invert it. Well, you can see right away that if this is the value of x and that's the value of y in terms of t's, then the ratio of this to this is t. So t is in fact uh, we can go backwards with a map that takes t to be y over x, and we could say it literally take s to be zero, and t is y over x. So s t is. Uh, 0, y over x. And that's perfectly well defined, except, of course, the problematic question of what to do at the origin, where x is 0, and, and it may be, you know, at any other point where x is 0. Um, so we, we're, we're a bit worried about what to do there, but otherwise, um, it's a perfectly happy situation. And it's a birational map, because um, most of the points, typically, of this curve won't have x equals 0, and so there isn't really a problem. Um, this rational function has denominator not vanishing everywhere on the curve, and so it's a perfectly happy map. And so this is a this map going this way is given by this expression here, and then its inverse map is given by this expression here. It's a very simple expression here. So you can see an example, a sophisticated example of of a st of the straight line in the plane being by rational to some much more complicated curve. Let's see a simple application of all of this, um, of all of these ideas. Let's think about integrals. We talked a little bit, very briefly, la before about about uh, integration um, by uh, by parts, which is a powerful technique to integrate rational functions. I didn't really do a lot on it. Um, there's much more in the notes. Let's consider an algebraic curve given by some polynomial g of x y equals zero. Um, so this suppose is an irreducible plane algebraic curve over the real numbers. And we'll work entirely over the real numbers. And our favorite example is always um, the curve given by y squared equals x squared plus x cubed, which we've looked at many, many times. And we'll write locally this, this guy locally um, in some region of the xy plane where it becomes the graph of a function. So this is maybe some very, very complicated curve in our, in our favorite example. It's already fairly complicated. Um, little pieces of it have y as a function of x. So this piece here, this piece here, this piece here, this piece here. But, you know, you can't really hang around here too well. Um, things are nasty there and there uh, for writing y as a function of x near those points. But otherwise, most point, mo near most points of the curve, typically you can write it locally, uh, write it as um, a y as some y of x. Um, maybe this is no longer not rational. Um, it might not be rational. And in our example of an example, in our example here, um, that's exactly the case. You get y equals the square root of x squared plus x cubed, plus or minus. And uh, it certainly involves a square root, and there's no getting around it, so it isn't going to be actually a rational function. Now, um, suppose we take a rational function a rational function um, f of x, y on the curve, on the algebraic curve. So this algebraic curve, we imagine in general we have an arbitrary al reducible algebraic curve, but in our specific example it's this curve. Um, and we locally write it as the graph of function. In our specific example it's this function, we'll have to jump to the choice of whether it's a plus or a minus. Take any rational function, um, and then uh, f of x and y, and then the question is, can you integrate it? And what I mean by integrated, I mean integrate f of x, and what do I put in for y? Well, that function y of x, which in our case would be this thing, which is not rational. It's some horrible function. It's some awful function. We plug it in here. There's a pretty terrible function appearing here. The f is irrational, but that's nowhere near rational. And this thing, maybe in particular in our example, this thing could be quite horrible. Uh, write that in integral dx. And can you solve it? 
Um, well, in general, we can't. In general, we don't know how to solve integrals of this form. But for lots of them, we do. If c is rational, is a rational curve, then we can, um, and this, this happens surprisingly frequently in, in lots of mathematical applications, we can parameterize it by rational functions, x of t, y of t. Now those won't work everywhere. They'll only work in certain region of the curve where this rational parameterization will work out nicely. In some places it'll be quite terrible. But still, this integral then of f dx, by which I mean this integral here, you plug in this horrible function y, this could be quite awful, into a rational function. You've got a, a, an integral which involves irrational functions, and so we can't just use partial fractions. It doesn't follow from any of the techniques we know. But if the curve is irrational, then it does turn out to be something we can do, because we write it as, plug in the rational parameterization, f of x of t, y of t, instead of y of x of t, um, and then um, dx dt dt. And so if we're only really going over the chunk of the curve where y is given by this function of x, but x and y are both given as functions of this t in that, in some, in some interval of t's, then we can write it like this. And then this is rational, this is rational, this is rational, this is rational, it's all rational. And so it's the near goal of a rational function of t dt. And so we can do it. And so we've said before that you can do it by partial fraction um, decomposition, an integral of partial fraction decomposition of the rational functions, that rational function, and dt. So you get some messy partial fraction. And so you can really do these integrals. Let's just see how we'll do it in our, ex in our example. Um, so if we go back to our, our favorite example again. Um, so our curve is y squared is x squared plus x cubed. We even saw how to solve for all the points on that curve. and We could find them all explicitly. And we take, let's say, just for simplicity, let's take f of x and y to be x cubed over y. Uh, it's a rational function. It doesn't have to be a nice smooth function. It can have terrible singularities, and that's fine. Um, and then the integral of that function dx, by which I mean, again, the integral of that function x, and then uh, y was square root x squared plus x cubed, uh, plus or minus, uh, dx. Um, so you're taking this thing and plugging that in, and that's so the integral of, you take the x component and cube it, and then you divide by that, so it's x cubed dx divided by this guy, square root of x squared plus x cubed. So that looks pretty awful. Um, it looks like a pretty nasty integral to try and do. Um, but um, how nasty is it really? Well, we said that we could parameterize this rationally. We even discovered how to un uncover this such a parameterization where it came from by letting x be t squared minus 1 and y be t times t squared minus 1. We did that again, you remember, by um, by taking the algebraic curve and just looking at all of the, we knew it went through the origin, we looked at all the lines of the origin and saw which points where they hit the curve and solve for that. So um, so we were able to produce this beautiful parameterization by a very geometric technique. We got, we parameterized this curve and then we just plug in here this into here and we get that the integral is equal to the integral of well x is now t squared minus one so x cubed is t squared minus one cubed this was really y this was an integral of that expression was y but y is this guy um, so what we get is a uh, is um is uh y rather than the square root we can throw out this horrible square root factor here, and all of that just becomes y, and y is just this thing. So it's t times t squared minus 1, and then uh, we have to do dx dt dt, so d of t squared dx. Because it was an integral dx, now we have to turn it into integral dx dt dt. When you do substitutions and integrals, you get dx dt dt. And that's t squared minus 1. So that I can easily do. That I can easily do. There's three t squared minus 1s here. But there's one of them down here. So I can cancel out one of them. This involves, this becomes 2t. And that cancels with a t here. So you get a simpler expression. And I won't uh, do it from there. I'll let you work out the rest of the details. Um, so it's not hard to do. Again, it's just a partial fraction decomposition. So this gives a serious example where, um, where really nasty looking integrals could actually turn out to be expressible in terms of rational functions. And then using our abstract theory of partial fraction decomposition, we can figure out how to solve those.
Um, so it gives us lots of interesting integrals that we can do, and they are integrals that have come up in important applications. So um, it would be nice if we had some idea of what we were talking about. Why, why did we call these things ideals in the first place? And I just want to make a few comments really on that. Um, we start off with an example of an algebraic curve, plain algebraic curve over a field K. Um, if you take a point in the curve, and you write the point as some um, X naught and Y naught, um, and it's a point uh, with coordinates in K, it's a point over K, um, then, um, then you can consider these polynomials vanish at that point, well, sort of X minus X naught, Y minus Y, vanish at that point, um, and therefore any function with a multiple of them vanishes, so the ideal generated by X minus X naught, Y minus Y naught, which is the functions which look like um, any multiple of x with a set of x minus x naught times polynomial um, plus y minus y naught times another polynomial. Okay. Those polynomials vanish as the set of all those such that p and q are polynomials, which I won't write out. Um, so all the functions that look like that, they make this ideal, and that ideal um, consists of the functions that vanish at that point. So that's, um, that's equal to the set of, of um, well, regular functions vanishing at that point p naught, and we'll think of this as an ideal not inside the polynomials but inside the regular functions of the curve. So that gives us a, a, a collection of ideals. Um, we've got for each point of the curve we've got an ideal, and that's where the word ideal comes from. It comes from the fact that um, that these points are just thought of as, as you can say that to each point you've got an ideal. Um, and then if you were to find that instead x naught and y naught were to move away, not be an, uh, defined over k anymore, but defined, to say, over some k bar, you would move off the curve, but you'd move, still be on the curve in, in, the, in the k bar points. And so you can think of that, that there are other ideals that, that, that where the x naught and the y naught really are coming from, from uh, points of k bar. And so somehow it's possible. Well, let's just look at some examples of that. But the idea starts off with saying that this means for each point we've got an ideal which represents that point in some sense. This ideal tells us what the point p naught is. It identifies that point. So certain ideals r uh, represent points. So if, if we look instead at, um, say, say, another example, we, um, we look at the real numbers and we look at the polynomials in, in re with a real coefficient, then um, for each real number uh, you can get, so each real number x naught, you can define an ideal which consists of the, so the ideal generated by x minus x naught, same, same notion, just uh, consists exactly of the polynomials, the set of polynomials that have an x minus x naught factor times a polynomial of x with for any polynomial p of x. Um, so that's a, another ideal, and but it's again representing by by this i, it's representing a single point. Um, I represents one point. Um, but similarly, we could look at instead of one point, what about two points? We could consider an ideal which is generated by um, by x minus x naught, x minus x one. So that would be consists of the ideal of functions that vanish in both x naught and x one. So it's like a pair of points. So the ideal can not only behave like a point, it somehow represents and knows about some point. It's the functions vanishing at that point. It could be the functions vanishing at two points. And then it sort of looks like somehow as, as if the ideal is like a ideal is. It sort of represents or is like uh, a pair of points. And similarly, an ideal could, re in some sense, represent any finite set of points. We could take the ideal of, 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 of regular functions vanishing at those points. So this gives us a sense that ideals aren't just like points, they're like collections of points, or like geometric objects. So a more sophisticated example, we could just look at, um, uh, we could look at the rational numbers. Um, so let's work over Q, and we'll take the plane algebraic curve, which is just the parabola y equals x squared. It's just the parabola, um, but uh, and inside its regular functions, we can look at. Remember that its regular functions are just the functions of x, because you can set the y to be x squared. Um, so uh, inside there, you have this ideal. Um, inside the regular functions, you have the ideal, which we can write in terms of this description of the of the functions as being um, x minus two times um, the ideal generated by x minus two by setting x to be 2. But if x is 2, y has to be x squared. So y has to be um, 
sorry, if I want, um, sorry, if I, I want y, what was it, y, y equals 2. So if I want y to be 2, x has to be a square root of y, and there's no rational square root. And so this means this, this sort of equation, it exists, it's, you know, it's certainly happy to be an ideal contained inside the, uh, contained inside these functions. But it's not the ideal of any actual point that lives in the rational numbers. It somehow is almost as if this ideal was somehow aware, as if it was given the secret knowledge that the real numbers exist. It's only been handed the rational numbers, and you've taken only rational number expressions, and out of them you've written y equals x squared, y equals 2. And so x has to be somehow a square root of 2. But there are no square roots of 2 in the rationals. So this is sort of where the ancient Greeks were when they started to realize that there were irrational numbers. That, they, that, it, that you could somehow abstractly pretend they exist and just write down an expression square root 2 and play with it as if it existed by essentially adjoining it to the, to the field of irrational functions. And that's what this ideal, ideal seems to know about. It seems to know that there is a square root of 2. It's a kind of ideal point living outside the rationals, living inside the reals. Another example, if we go back to our real numbers, um, and we looked at the ideal generated by taking two different points, um, looking at the functions that vanish at both those points, it somehow represented this, the collection of the two points, um, so x0 and x1. Somehow this we can picture in our heads this ideal as knowing that there are these two points here and it consists of the functions that vanish at the one and that also vanish at the other one, and then do whatever they want to do. Um, so it's, it's, it consists of all those sort of functions. It knows about those two points. What about if we make the, the points collide with each other? Intuitively, we'd expect a kind of limiting ideal, which would consist of x minus x naught squared. In other words, it'd be that consist of all the polynomials, so it's the ideal generated by x minus x naught squared, so it's the set of polynomials of the form x minus x naught squared times polynomial of x. So those are the poly of all polynomials of x. So it's the polynomials that look like they have an x minus x naught squared factor. In other words, they vanish twice at x naught. So there are polynomials that don't just vanish, but that vanish twice uh, to second order. They don't just vanish once. Um, they vanish to second order. And, and so in some sense, it looks as if that's like a double point, because we took two points and ran them into each other, and then took a kind of limit, roughly speaking, very intuitively speaking, without worrying about details about what exactly it means to take a limit of ideals. But we took a kind of limiting behavior. As x1 became x2, we found that we were forcing double points. And so we can think of this ideal as something like representing a double point. So ideals can represent not only geometrically points that don't seem to want to exist in the actual space we're working in, that are sort of ideal points that live out there somewhere. They also can represent things like double points. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the intersections of plane algebraic curves.